not answering. Somebody stabbed in business class. And um, I think there's mates that we can't breathe. I, I don't know. I think we're getting hijacked. We can shoot down aircraft that do not respond to our direction. Copy that? You read that from the Vice President, right? Vice President has cleared. As the president was getting ready to go into a classroom filled with very young second graders, uh, a staffer from the Situation Room came up to the president, the principal of the school, and to me as we stood at the door and said, Sir, it appears a small twin-engine prop plane crashed into one of the towers at the World Trade Center in New York City. Our collective response was, oh, what a horrible accident. The pilot must have had a heart attack or something. And then the principal of the school opened the door to the classroom and the president went into the classroom.
And then a nanosecond later, uh, that same st staffer came to me and said, oh my gosh, another plane hit the other tower at the World Trade Center. And I knew that I had to tell the president. I made a decision to pass on two facts and make one editorial comment. And then there was a break in the conversation at the front of the classroom and I walked up to the president. I leaned over and whispered into his right ear, a second plane hit the second tower. America is under attack. I then stood back from the president so that he couldn't ask me a question. We positioned at Andrews Air Force Base, Washington, D.C., the night before, on September 10th. As part of the war game, one essential aircraft is repositioned from Nebraska to the East Coast. The Doomsday Plane, or more officially, the National Emergency Airborne Command Post, remains on standby, the place the nation's war plans can be carried out, even if an enemy destroys the Pentagon or STRATCOM. My first impression was this is part of the exercise. I didn't have any news or television on, so not knowing anything else, I'm believing that this is strictly exercise purposes. Frontline managers went back out into the workforce and said, okay, we gotta put these aircraft on the ground. So they were working with the controllers to then tell the pilots, you're gonna have to land. We told them, you're not leaving our airspace, you're going to have to pick an airport, get a hold of the company, tell us where you're going to go and where you're going to land. Uh, very difficult for our controllers. And as you can imagine, with the hundreds of flights just in Boston Center alone, what that would take when the other side of the mic has never done this before, has never heard of it, and all of a sudden we're implementing. Incredible feat by our workforce. And so that's what we did. We started evacuating the offices in the West Wing. We had the Secret Service yelling at us to get everybody out. Just get out and run. And as I exit the diplomatic reception room doors, I saw a huge flash of black smoke and fire. It was the fireball from the plane that flew into the Pentagon. The head chef came running back into the kitchen and they said, the Pentagon just got hit. We could be next. Evacuate. A young lady who worked for the usher's office at the White House grabbed me, saying, Roland, get out, get out. Go as far as you can. We are under attack. For safe refueling, the president's security team ordered a landing at Barksdale Air Force Base, the STRATCOM facility in Louisiana. I mean, the latest word we have now is the president has touched down at Shreveport, Louisiana. At 9.57 a.m., Air Force One hits the runway in a full throttle takeoff. Two F-16 fighter jets join it soon after, providing an outer perimeter of defense. They're loaded with air-to-air -air and air-to-ground missiles that can take out a target 72 kilometers away. The Secret Service must keep the President in the air, avoiding Washington, until a secure landing zone can be found. But the President must still run the country as if he were in the Oval Office. Air Force One is equipped for the task. Its upper level is dedicated to communications. 238 kilometers of wiring, 85 onboard telephones, 19 television monitors, internet connections, and state-of-the-art signal encryption enable the president and staff to stay in touch anywhere in the world. I don't even know how much fire equipment they've been able to move up onto those. Oh, it's just coming down, Pat. It is just coming down. 
coming down. Watch the right it's side. It's exploding. It's ripping apart. It is billowing. Pat, the debris is flying. I'm going to run. Okay. On the morning of September 11th, when the towers came down, millions of people ran for safety. Hundreds of thousands of them ran south to the water's edge. That's when they realized that Manhattan is indeed an island and that they were trapped. Boats, usually an afterthought in most New Yorkers' minds, were for the first time in over a century the only way in or out of Lower Manhattan. There was a small boat that was uh, at the lower tip of Manhattan. I thought the boat was going to flip over because so many people were trying to get on. And as I looked behind, they were, they were just 10 deep. And that's kind of what gave us the idea. We decided that this has to get better organized and we better do it. And that's what we did. So we decided to make the call on the radio. All available boats. This is the United States Coast Guard board, the pilot boat, New York. Anyone want to help with the evacuation of Lower Manhattan? Report to Governor's Island. When that call came on the radio, they were coming. I was uncertain of who was going to respond. About 15, 20 minutes later, there are just boats all across the horizon. Literally a hundred targets converging on the lower part of Manhattan. When we came out of that dust cloud, tugboats, I've never seen so many tugboats all at once. There was just a, like a fleet of tugboats headed to Manhattan. If it floated and it could get there, it got there. All different size, shapes, and form. I mean, and they were zooming across this water. Ferries, private boats, party boats. I worked on the water for 28 years. I've never seen that many boats come together at one time that fast. One radio call and it just came together just that fast. Shortly after that, the second tower just collapsing into a pile of rubble. Here's the AP lead out of New York. In a horrific sequence of destruction, terrorists crashed two planes into the World Trade Center and the twin 110-story towers collapsed this morning.
Air Force One has taken off, President Bush being flown to an undisclosed location. We're told all Air Force One Air was on the move again. Word came to Stratcom, get ready. Good afternoon, I'm Rob McCartney in the KETV Newsplex. We are breaking in for a brief update on what's happening here in the heartland. Air Force One has landed at Offutt Air Force Base. President Bush is greeted by then Stratcom Chief Admiral Richard Meads. The president's entourage immediately heads to the underground. Washington Air Force One, we'd like to lower, please. Air Force One departing 15 for 7,000. Air Force One, turn left at the end, contact ground point 8. Air Force One copies. We are to land. There will be uh, possibly one or two uh, fighter type aircraft landing on the east runway up just uh, after our arrival. Air Force One, request approved. President Bush arrived back in Washington a few moments ago to a, essentially a silent city, Washington, D.C., much like the lower part of Manhattan has been. As we lifted off of out of Andrews Air Force Base on Marine One, I could see the smoke of the Pentagon. And uh, I remember thinking, here I am, the commander in chief in a war zone. Uh, we'd been attacked by an enemy right here in the heart of our capital. The Marine One pilot took evasive action flying this thing as if we are in a war zone. And um, uh, we came pretty close to the Pentagon. It was an eerie sight to look down. The contrast was unbelievable between a vibrant city and a city that had been shut down because of an attack. President Bush is back at the White House. He went directly to the Oval Office. We're now told we'll be speaking about an hour from now at 8.30. Live continuing coverage on 10. The guy that works at the ferry, he's a, a welder. His son was on my boat. He, he actually came up. Uh, He thanked me. We went back and forth all day long, carrying boatloads, as many as our, our boat would hold. And it was a lot of people. A lot of people. You couldn't have planned nothing to happen that fast, that quick. No training. This was just people doing what they had to do that day. You forget all about what you're supposed to do, what to teach you in school, and you say, you know what? Morally, this is the right way to go, and deep down, this is what I'm gonna do. Average people, they stepped up, and uh, when they needed to, they showed me, you know, when the American people need to come together and pull together, they will do it. I do feel a way honored that I was a part of it. It was the greatest thing I ever did with my life. The greatest day that I've ever seen in all my boating, I mean, my life on the water. The great boat lift of 9-11 became the largest sea evacuation in history. Larger than the evacuation of Dunkirk in World War II, where 339,000 British and French soldiers were rescued over the course of nine days. On 9-11, nearly 500,000 civilians were rescued from Manhattan by boat. It took less than nine hours. We will stand with the president, we will stand with this government, and we will stand as Americans together through this time. Thank you. Today's despicable acts were an assault on our people and on our freedom. As the representatives of the people, we are here to declare that our resolve has not been weakened by these horrific and cowardly acts.
Congress will convene tomorrow. And we will speak with one voice to condemn these attacks, to comfort the victims and their families, to commit our full support to the effort to bring those responsible to justice. We, Republicans and Democrats, House and Senate, stand strongly united behind the president and will work together to ensure that the full resources of the government are brought to bear in these efforts. Our heartfelt thoughts and our fervent prayers are with the injured and the families of those who have been lost. We know as a nation, as we said, our thoughts and prayers are with those families and those injured and those who are the casualties of today's attack. We also remember those thousands of people who are rescue workers. We ask now that we all bow our heads in a moment of silence and remembrance. A display of bipartisan unity at this critical moment in U.S. history. It seemed like a spontaneous uh, singing of God Bless America by scores of members of the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate, s seriously trying to send a message of unity during this difficult moment.
I had no clue of what was really going on. And he began to describe to me what had happened with the World Trade Center, uh, the plane that had crashed into the Pentagon. And then as we were talking, he said, another plane has just crashed in Pennsylvania. We don't know what that's all about. I raced around and found a video camera and a window facing in the right direction. The weather was perfectly clear that day. I could easily see New York City, a uh, big black column of smoke coming out of the city. And as I zoomed in with the video camera, I could see this big gray blob enveloping southern Manhattan. What we were seeing was the second tower come down. We could see New York City and the smoke from the fires. Our prayers and thoughts go out to all the people there and uh, everywhere else here. I'm looking up and down the East Coast to see if I can see anything else. say you'll never forget where you were when you heard the news on September 11th, 2001. Neither will I. I was on the 110th floor in a smoke-filled room with a man who called his wife to say goodbye. I held his fingers steady as he dialed. I gave him the peace to say, Honey, I'm not going to make it. But it's okay, I'm ready to go. I was with his wife when he called as she fed breakfast to their children. I held her up as she tried to understand his words. And as she realized he wasn't coming home that night, I was in the stairwell of the 23rd floor when a woman cried out to me for help. I've been knocking on the door of your heart for 50 years. I said, of course, I'll show you the way home. Only believe in me now. I was at the base of the building when the priest ministered to the injured and devastated souls. I took him home to tend his flock in heaven. He heard my voice and answered. I was on all four of those planes, in every seat, with every prayer. I was with the crew as they were overtaken. I was in the very hearts of the believers there comforting and assuring them that their faith has saved them. I was in Texas, Kansas, London. I was standing next to you when you heard the terrible news. Did you sense me? I want you to know that I saw every face. I knew every name, though not all know me. Some met me for the first time on the 86th floor. Some sought me with their last breath. Some couldn't hear me calling to them through the smoke and flames. Come to me, this way, take my hand. Some chose for the final time to ignore me, but I was there. I did not place you in the tower that day. You may not know why, but I do. However, if you were there in that explosive moment in time, would you have reached for me? September 11th, 2001 was not the end of the journey for you. But someday your journey will end and I'll be there for you as well. C. 
seek me now while I may be found. Then, at any moment, you know you're ready to go. I will be in the stairwell of your final moments. Remember, I love you.